This video will review section 2.2, the simulation test and theoretical test for a single mean. First, I would recommend reviewing the preliminaries video, which goes over the basic descriptive statistics information for a single quantitative variable. Most importantly, be sure you understand what type of plots can be used to display a quantitative variable, what four aspects should be used to describe the distribution of a quantitative variable, and what summary measures we should use when exploring quantitative data. In section 2.1, we covered the notation for the statistics or parameters we often record for quantitative data, but let's review those now. Typically, we will be interested in the mean and standard deviation of a sample, so the statistic notation we will use for mean is x bar, and a sample standard deviation is denoted s. The parameter notation for mean is mu, mu is the Greek letter for m standing for mean, and the notation for a population standard deviation is sigma, the Greek letter for s. Be very careful. s is the sample standard deviation and is therefore telling us about the spread or variability of individuals in the sample. Similarly, sigma gives the variability of individuals in a population. Neither of these values measure sampling variability or the variability between different samples a very similar process to the hypothesis tests for a single proportion. We start with a null and alternative hypothesis. The hypotheses are still written in terms of the population parameter, which for a single mean is symbolized by mu. The null hypothesis still uses an equal sign, and the sign in the alternative is determined by the research question. Note here the idea of random chance is a bit harder to define for means. So think of the value in the null and alternative as a standard the researcher wants to measure against, like 8 hours of sleep, or a body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We could also use previous research or data as the null hypothesis to see if a population has changed over time. Recall the 3S strategy for a simulation test. We will follow the same process for means as we did for proportions. But now the statistic, the first s, will typically be our sample mean, x bar. Note in Exploration 2.2, you also saw that we could use the standardized statistic or the median as the statistic for the 3s strategy, but we will typically use the sample mean. Next, we need to simulate thousands of samples, which will assume the null hypothesis is true, and plot the statistic from each of those samples. This will be discussed next. Finally, we will calculate our p-value the same way as always. Compare our observed statistic, the first s, to the simulated null distribution. We could also find our strength of evidence by calculating the standardized statistic to be discussed later. How can we simulate a null distribution for a single mean? For one proportion, recall we use spinners or coins because we had a probability of success under the null hypothesis. That is no longer the case. Now we have a population mean under the null hypothesis, so we need to use our one sample to create many samples which assume the null hypothesis is true. We know from the bootstrapping video that bootstrapping will allow us to create many samples from our original data, but how can we force the null hypothesis to be true? If we add the null value minus the sample mean to each data value, the mean of these shifted data will be the null value. Shifting the data will not change the spread of the sample, so we will still have an accurate idea about the standard deviation of the population. Therefore, bootstrap resampling from the shifted data will allow us to create many, many samples from a bootstrap distribution with mean equal to the null value and standard deviation approximately the same as the population standard deviation, assuming that the original sample is in fact representative of the population. In short, to simulate a null distribution for a single mean, we will first shift the data by adding mu naught minus x bar to each data value, then sample with replacement n, our sample size, times from the shifted data. See the video on single mean applets to see this in practice. Note that we can use the standard deviation of the simulated null distribution, which is the standard deviation of the simulated sample means as the denominator in finding our standardized statistic. Our standardized statistic is still calculated by subtracting the null value from the observed statistic and dividing by the standard deviation of the statistic. 
linear p-value, we of course want to evaluate and interpret it. P-value interpretations are the same as before and must include the observed statistic, typically the sample mean, the direction, still determined by the alternative hypothesis, and the fact that we have assumed the null hypothesis to be true, where the null hypothesis states something about the population mean. Smaller p-values still provide stronger evidence against the null hypothesis, and we would still write conclusions in the same format, where we include our strength of evidence and answer the research question, or put our conclusion in terms of the alternative hypothesis. A second method of analysis is the theory-based method. The central limit theorem, the same theorem which told us about the distribution of proportions from many samples, says the same thing about means, that means will be approximately normally distributed, centered at the population mean, with standard deviation sigma over the square root of n. Again, we need to check that the sample size is large enough, but the way to check this condition has changed. Now there are two options to satisfy the validity condition. Either the distribution of the population, and therefore the sample, is roughly symmetric, or the distribution of the sample is not heavily skewed, and we have a sample size of at least 20. As long as either validity condition is met, we can use a calculated standardized statistic and compare that to the standard normal distribution to obtain our p-value. Here, we show you how to calculate the standard deviation of the sample means using sigma, the population standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, rather than using the standard deviation of the simulated null distribution. But we have a problem. We don't know sigma. We can replace sigma with s, the standard deviation of the sample, in the formula for the standard deviation of the sample means. We just use the term standard deviation a lot, so let's be sure we understand each part. As a reminder, s is the variability of individuals, like the variability in each person's hours of sleep. se of x bar is the estimated variability of the sample means, like the variability in the mean hours of sleep from different classes. Clearly, means will vary less than individual observations, and we see this in the formula as the spread of means is actually found by taking the spread of individuals and dividing by the square root of n. So the larger the sample size, the less the sampling variability of means from different samples, which is an idea we have discussed before. Now, since we have used s instead of sigma, there is a bit more uncertainty in our resulting distribution. We will use a t-distribution instead of the standard normal. The t-distribution is very like the standard normal distribution. It's still bell-shaped, symmetric, and centered at zero, but it's just a bit wider to account for this additional uncertainty. For a comparison of the standard normal distribution in dark blue and two different t-distributions. The df in the picture stands for degrees of freedom, which is found by subtracting one from the sample size. You do not need to worry about degrees of freedom for STAT 216, but do note that as the degrees of freedom increases, or as we have a larger sample size, the t-distribution becomes narrower and closer to the standard normal. In fact, a t-distribution with infinite degrees of freedom actually is the standard normal distribution. In practice, we will use the ISI theory-based applet to complete a theoretical t-test for a single mean. There's a video explaining how to use the theory-based single mean applet. 